So I'll just introduce myself. I think Pete um, wheeled me out for this evening as a scientist, but sometimes I feel like a bit of a fake because I've only been a scientist for three years. Um, my background's a bit unusual because um, I started uh, life as a, as a nurse um, and I only actually went back to university at the age of 52 to retrain in um, conservation and biodiversity at Lancaster University where I discovered that I actually have dyslexia after uh, many years when I couldn't do coding. So that was a massive big challenge for me going back to, uh, um, to university as a, a mature person. Um, so as, um, as Pete said, I'm standing in today for um, Professor Mike Bernards-Lee, who's my boss at Small World Consulting. Mike knows everything about this like the back of his hands. Um, so if I hit a question that I can't answer, um, I'll try and be honest with you and say, I don't know, but I'll go and find out um, if I don't know the answer. Mike's um, uh, pretty well known for the books that he's written, which are How Bad Are Bananas? And There's No Planet B, which is the, the book that often you see on a lot of the banners that are being waved on the television there these days. And basically Mike and the team back in 2020 did a carbon baseline for Cumbria, um, which basically looked at setting all the targets um, for how we were gonna reduce emissions in Cumbria, aiming for 2037. So that's a little bit of background about that. So Basically the slide, and I have to apologize for some of the graphs that we've put in tonight, but I'll try and explain them as best as I, I can. But basically this is a slide which Mike often shows looking at global energy use. So this is the energy use that's being used around the world um, that they've been recording since 1850. And one of the interesting things you'll see is, is how quickly those slides are going up in terms of energy use. And one of the reasons for that, which is you know, really quite obvious, is because of the industrial era, we've started innovating more, particularly in terms of IT and technology. So you know, back in my days when I was younger, we didn't have mobile phones. And now you know, most children even have mobile phones these days or access to tablets, laptops, televisions. I, I remember black and white TV um, back in London when I was growing up. And, um, so basically with all those increases and increasing use of technology that we're seeing and mechanization, industrialization, the use of energy is just going up and up and up and up. Um, and that's one of the biggest drivers that we have for greenhouse gases. So I'll just explain a little bit about the the different types of greenhouse gases that we're seeing and, and the ones which are sort of particularly worrying. So the, big, the biggest one that, that um, most people are worried about are, is carbon dioxide. And um, the little CO2 sign at the side of it is basically what the scientists tend to use for shorthand when they're describing those. So whenever you read say government reports, you may see the word in full, but you'll see these little symbols as well um, that tell you what they are. So basically carbon dioxide generally tends to hang around the atmosphere um, in, in terms of the air, um, unless it can be absorbed back into the environment in some shape or form, such as back into to trees or into soils. So otherwise it just hangs up there in the air um, almost acting like a blanket over the, the earth, basically trapping the sun's rays and heats that come up so it bounces back at us, basically increasing temperatures. Other ones that you'll hear about, especially if you start getting into agriculture and farming, is around methane. Um, and that's basically because we all generate it. Um, cows noticeably um, more so than humans when we basically digest our food. We also obviously see methane coming out the ground and it's used in um, some power stations and then gets burnt and it'll turn into carbon dioxide over here. So that's one that causes a lot of concern in the, the farming community and is a big challenge for the carbon community that we have. 
Another one that's formed is nitrous oxide. And again, this is the little symbol for it that you'll see, N2O, um, along with carbon dioxide. And that predominantly tends to come out, say, from, from cars. So when we have, say, older cars that, you know, sometimes you see them driving up the road and there's a lot of um, uh, dust and smoke coming out of them, it generally means they're burning far more, um, emitting far more emissions than you would expect. And then we've got another group which get a bit more complicated, but I've just put the, the fluorinated gases. So there's a whole number of them, but the ones that probably people are most familiar with because you'll have seen when you're buying, say, new washing machines or, or sort of new fridges, you're looking for this AA kind of rating. Part of that is because in the UK particularly, they've been trying to get rid of these fluorocarbons out of the um, the fridges say that we're using. So you tend to see it less of it in the UK, but if you've got a really old fridge or freezer that you might have had for like 20, 30 years in your garage, then you may find that it's got more um, fluorinated gases within it. So basically there's, if we look at the carbon footprint of, of people, um, just moving on to, to this slide, there's, Greenhouse gases are emitted through those processes that we sort of mentioned in terms of industry and, and what's going on, but they're also emitted in terms of us as people and what we actually consume. And this was some research that Mike did um, with our colleagues at Lancaster University to look at a, a, the greenhouse footprint of people. And you may see this figure, 12.7 tonnes of um, carbon dioxide equivalent. If I just explain what that means in terms of amounts, if I were to plant an entire um, field in terms of a hectare of trees, it would typically absorb um, 500 tonnes of carbon over a 100 year period. So that gives you a feel for how much carbon year on year, we're actually consuming ourselves. So basically, if you, you know, carried on for, for sort of say five, 10 years, you, you'll, you'll end up, um, you know, sort of using up the equivalent of say a, a hectare of, of land. So basically one of the biggest factors that, that comes from is travel and for people, one of the, the biggest culprits within that is air travel. And we recognise it's important because many people have got families abroad these days and want to go and see them. So we're not saying people shouldn't fly, but they need to be far more mindful about the frequency with which they fly. So, you know, a prime example of when people are maybe going out for um, pub crawls overseas, you know, for weddings and things like that, where they're just flying over for a weekend and they're going for flights. So if they're going for long haul flights, they all make a, a massive big difference. So generally one of the principles that we look at is if you can sort of, of not fly if you possibly can or minimize the amount that you fly, that makes a massive big difference. The other factor is food. Um, and that's one of the most challenging because we all have to eat, but there are food choices that we can make that make a, make a massive big difference. And we can sort of go into some of those around the the questions that we have, especially the differences between the types of meat that people may eat, or ideally eating more of a plant-based diet in terms of fruit and veg. And then you've got your home and accommodation, which is, you know, we all know we all pay our gas electric bills and, and have our running expenses around that. And then we've got everything else. And the next slide just shows a bit more about the detail behind that which may help you when you start to look at this further as, as part of the work that you're doing. Um, we've got the breakdowns between food and drink from shops, 23%, but eating out 2% for people. There's a whole different breakdown about housing. So one of the biggest factors people can do is look for um, sustainably sourced electricity as far as possible and switching over to those. The other factors are around our cars and how much we drive, can we reduce that in some way, and then flights. And then the others all relate to sort of recreation and wastewater and factors like that. But those will be some sort of useful factors that you can 
help to inform what we do. One of the things, what, Peter, right, you, you mentioned sustainably sourced electricity. What, what's that? Yeah, basically, um, uh, there's different types of ways that electricity is generated from, say, coal powered fire stations or gas fired power, power stations or looking at solar or wind energy. Um, there's also nuclear energy as well. So basically, if you can maybe potentially swap to someone who's sourcing more electricity from, say, renewable energy, such as solar or wind or hydro um, electric energy, then those all actually help. Um, and if you have a look at, say, the Ethical Consumer website, um, that's a really good source of information about who's trying to do work ethically and who isn't in the industry. The other thing that Pete asked me to mention that we need to think about in terms of our carbon footprints is if you look on, say, the government websites for the carbon footprint of a person, you'll find that it's lower than the figure we've put here. But that's because in doing this work, we've looked at, say, if you're looking at purchasing clothing or products that are being made in, say, China or India, we in effect export our greenhouse emissions over to those countries. Um, and so the work that we did was looking at taking those factors into um, account to actually come up with a, a more realistic true value of what our own greenhouse emissions are. So those are some of the things that you may have to just be mindful of is about what's being exported in terms of greenhouse gas emissions when you're actually buying um, products when you're out in the shops. And then we also have emissions that are released from nature. And um, I've put in a couple of pictures here of what I consider an own goal. Um, because these were where fires were deliberately set on Winter Hill, which is a giant upland peatlands of which you've got upland peatlands in Cumbria. And those fires lasted 41 days, burning deep into the, the peat there, basically causing both particulate matter, which is sort of the hor small, horrible sort of dust particles that get in your lungs, but as well as also releasing um, uh, carbon dioxide into the into the atmosphere. And that's one of the risks that we have in terms of Cumbria because of the peatlands that we've got when they become degraded, they're more likely to set on fire um, if people um, either deliberately or accidentally set them. So that brings me to um, this one, which is looking at asthma. Um, and this is something very close to my heart. And I've basically put it up because those small particles that get into people's lungs, especially children, make a massive big impact. Um, my grandfather was a miner um, and, you know, a lot of the miners received compensation in later life because they had um, lung disease later on. And basically almost 30 percent of deaths in England are preventable um, and are attributed to air pollution. And in the UK, there's 5.4 million people currently receiving asthma for treatment. And of those, we've got 1.1 million children and 4.3 million adults. So that's one in 11 children and one in 12 adults. And for me, one of the big things around this is about where housing is placed. And it broke my heart driving up the M6 when I actually saw housing estates which receive planning to be built next door to the motorways which seems to be quite common these days all we're actually doing is creating another generation of children that will have asthma by making those kind of planning decisions and every day the lives of three families are devastated by deaths of a loved one to an asthma attack and tragically two-thirds of these deaths are preventable so that's something that we also have to to think about because it you know it infects most families I think these days most people will know someone that who's got asthma and so if we've got all these gases going in the atmosphere they're invisible so we don't see them so it's hard for us to sort of you know think they're actually there when they're just there's nothing that you can actually see but we're seeing the impacts of of those we're seeing the impacts in terms of higher temperatures and changing rainfall patterns. 
And this picture that I've put on this side here is a photograph of Worley, which was my neck of the woods in 2015, um, when our village was flooded. Um, and the, the impact of that was absolutely massive in terms of displacing you know, my family for about the period of six months. And this was the reason I actually changed and went back to university to become a scientist because it absolutely hit home to me that this was real. We're then seeing changes in nature. And one of the biggest and worrying changes that we're seeing is this picture here around Arctic sea ice melting. And I was at COP in, back in November, and I met a scientist probably in about his seventies who'd been researching the Arctic for about 40 years. And you know, in, in his younger years, he used to go in Russian submarines up to the Arctic to actually go and measure those. And he said to me that this year, he said he was horrified because the temperature in the Arctic and the places he normally went to should have been minus 32 degrees and it was actually plus 32 degrees and this was an old scientist who's a very measured man and if he's saying there's a problem there's a problem because he's been watching these for for years Lorraine, you said you went to cop what's cop um cop was the um oh i've forgotten it's called now for what it stands for everyone just calls it cop 26 it's basically where all the different countries were meeting to discuss climate change in terms of how they're gonna prevent climate change and global warming. Um, so that was the event that took place in Glasgow, um, I think, when was it, back end of November? Um, no, sorry, beginning, well, back end of October, beginning of November. So the most worrying about the Arctic sea level rises is that we're gonna see increases in water. And so basically, uh, towns and villages that are below sea level or just above sea level are going to incrementally start to see increasing water um, in terms of the height of that over 100 years. And some of the, the global modelling, when you look at that as to what land is going to be affected, is extremely worrying in terms of, you know, cities that could potentially be flooded even more than they, they are doing so already. And I think in the past, maybe sort of 20 years ago, there was a lot of debate. Is it happening? Is it real? Is it not real? But I think increasingly the, the body of scientists that are involved in the intergovernmental panel on climate change, and there's a, a significant large number of them, are all coming out on the side that, yes, this is genuine and this is real and it's happening. And what we're doing is we're seeing changes which are basically becoming more frequent. So we're not saying that climatic changes don't happen, you know, because we've all heard about the ice age in the past. And I think, you know, people are aware that dinosaurs um, became extinct um, when there was massive climatic change, um, which they suspected was down to a meteor um, hitting the earth. But what we saw in, in 2015 in my neck of the woods, and these also impacted Cumbria, which is this is a photo of Newby Bridge, was increasing frequency and magnitude of those severe flood and weather events. So we ended up with Storm Desmond, followed by Storm Eva, um, and then basically the next bout of rain on Christmas and Boxing Day just basically flooded out our communities. And then it was followed on with Storm Frank. And what we were seeing basically is because of that increasing winter rainfall, the ground just gets saturated and it gets to a point where um, you just, you know, the water just has nowhere to go. And this was um, taken from a, a presentation that I was shown by the Environment Agency. And in the past, we used to sort of expect one in 100 year flood events. Like my sister's house in Morley, which I showed previously, They've even got deeds that basically recognise that those flood events did happen, but they happened infrequently. So they had, for instance, gardens by the river that just all flowed into one so they could become a natural floodplain. Oh, sorry, it's mixed over. Um, but what's happening now is that that's just increasing. So, for instance, I've had to go out to put up the flood defences um, twice since that point in the last five years 
and you know it nearly flooded again we literally were just about an inch away from the flood waters coming over so you know that's a massive big worry it's massive damage to to properties we've got five minutes left Lauren. oh sorry sorry i'll fly through now <laughs> so we've got the carbon footprint of um cumbria and this is the big piece of work that we did um and we looked at residents visitors um getting to and from the national park and visitors um, in the national park and industry. So I'm gonna basically try and whiz through to the slides that are probably of most information to you that we need to, to look at now. So overall, the scale of Cumbria's industry footprint is larger than the residents and visitors put, footprints put together. Um, and in terms of the emissions that we've got, these are the different district councils that we have. And you'll see that in Barrow and Furness, we've got 408 kilotons of carbon, at, uh, at carbon dioxide equivalent, and a kiloton is like a thousand tons that are being um, emitted in terms of industry emissions. And we've got different sectors that we look at when we count those emissions. So we've got industry and commercial and fuel, which is here. We've got agriculture and domestic energy, transport and land use, land use change and forestry. And if we look at Barrow and Furness, you'll see that the biggest proportion of that is coming from your industrial and commercial fuel use, followed then by agriculture. And if we take a bit of a close look at that, unfortunately, I couldn't get the, 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 the detailed breakdown on, on this one, which might have been a bit easier. But you can see that in terms of when you do a deeper dive into your industry, we've got industry and commercial electricity here, followed by large installations. And the biggest one is industrial, commercial and other fuel use. You've only got a relatively smaller proportion in terms of agriculture and industrial gases that are there. And in terms of manufacturing, um, it's a manufacturing is a big issue for um, for yourselves locally, in that manufacturing of basic materials counts for 56%, with manufacturing of equipment and machinery 14.4%, and transportation and storage 10.8%, and agriculture, forestry and fishing 4.4%, with electricity, gas, steam and air conditioning 3.3%. So the transportation and storage produce around a quarter of your industrial emissions in, in Barrow, and we've got some big large emitters in Barrow and Furness. We've got Alston Power um, Limited, um, and we've got BAE Systems, which I probably think you'd probably guess they were there. And these figures that we've got here are taken from um, a government database that shows the emissions. And you'll see for some of them, I've got three question marks where none of those emissions are reflected. So there's probably serious undercounting that we've got going on in terms of the data. But your biggest emitter is Hydrocarbon Resource Limited at Barrow. Um, and we've got some more information on that, which we can um, go into. Um, so BAEs you'll be familiar with, but Hydrocarbons Limited is the old name for Spirit Energy. And but you'll know that probably locally as Rampside Gas Terminal. And it's expected to reach the end of its production life by the mid late 2020s. Um, and there's plans for what they call net zero um, carbon capture. And this is a, a photograph that we have of it here. So what can companies do? So the first thing that we ask companies always to do is to count all their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you've, they've got three types that are counted when you look at government reports. They call them scope one, two and three. And most companies only count scope one and two because up to maybe a couple of years ago, there wasn't a legal requirement to count scope three. And the wrong, one of the reasons Mike went into to doing all this work was um, he re basically recognised that scope three emissions were the bulk of a company's emissions. In, in some companies, it went up to like 80% of emissions. 
Can you and, explain really quickly, Lorraine, what scope one, two and three means, please? Yeah, I'm going to just show you if I can just flip through to a different slide, if I can just okay. um, hold on for a minute. I'm just going to scope down here. I'll just sorry, I'll just have to whiz through and go backwards here. I've just put this slide here, which basically looks at what we do when we do our carbon accounting. So scope one emissions are the company facilities and the company vehicles that they use. Scope two, it looks at the purchased electricity and that's used heating and cooling, anything that's basically going into sort of energy use. And then scope three looks at their buildings that they lease, the employees travel, business travel, the waste that's generated, transport and distribution, fuel activities and capital goods. So in the past, companies were only legally required if they were large companies um, in law in the UK to report on this scope one and two, their companies and, and uh, facilities and vehicles in terms of the buildings they owned and the energy that they were using. So anything that was part of their supply chain that they bought in from other people um, wasn't counted. And, and that's why Mike basically started this whole process of, of looking at specializing in carbon accounting. Oh, sorry, go there. So we then basically asked people to set very, very hard targets to, to reduce their emissions because they- You've got a minute left, Laura. Yeah. Um, and part of that for your local areas, sorry, will be potentially looking at carbon capture if, if they're, um, you're looking at the energy industries there. But we also need to look at nature's carbon sinks that we can look at locally. And we've got peatlands, masses of peatlands that are a, a really good carbon sink, um, but they need restoring. So they're not degraders. They become net emitters if they degrade. And then you've got all your seaside coastal areas that can potentially store carbon. And then you've got trees, which sequester carbon, restoring of wetlands and regenerative farming in terms of soil. And that's me. <laughs> Tell us really quickly again, uh, remind us what a carbon, a natural carbon sink is, Lorraine. Yeah, basically it's anything that will, in nature, that will actually physically store carbon. So soil is absolutely wonderful um, because it, it stores carbon. Peatlands are wonderful because you'll see that some of our peatlands are like two metres deep in terms of soil. Um, in terms of trees, they get stored in the wood. Um, as part of their natural process. It basically just locks it into the trees. Um, although trees take a lot longer to, to grow, um, probably takes about five years before you start sequestering any meaningful amounts of carbon, 10 years, 30 years by the time you're looking at broadleaf woodland. So if we plant now, we might have them for our next generation. And this picture here is the woodland, the first woodland I ever planted with Ribble Rivers Trust um, that they call the rain's wood. <laughs> Um, and this is actually a, my nature reserve that I've, I'm trustee of where we reinstated the, the wetlands um, last year. And now that's beautiful and absolutely rich in plant life. Um, it acts as a natural floodplain for Clithero to basically mitigate flooding by 40% um, in terms of basically that was my response to my sister to say, you won't move. So I need to take on a floodplain and manage it so that you don't get flooded. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, 